During the time of Ezra, when Ezra stood up to read the word of God, we read in the Bible, the entire congregation stood while Ezra read the word. And so we're going to practice that today. Shall we all rise? I know we were standing, but let us all rise together and read Psalms 15. It's already projected on the screen. We can read it. It is in the NIV version. We are going to read it all together, okay? We are going to all read it together, the entire chapter of Psalms 15. Let's all begin. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill? He who walks is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong, and cast no slur on his fellow men, who despises a wild man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, when lends no money, and does not accept a bribe against an innocent. He accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Praise the Lord. You may be seated now. Thank you very much. Dear brothers and sisters, Psalms 15 is a psalm of David. David wrote the psalm and uh, it starts by saying, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary and who may live in your holy hill? A psalm of David and God's testimony about this man, David, is this. That David is a man according to God's own heart. Man according to God's own heart. Whose testimony is this? This is God's testimony about David. God has given many testimonies about people in the history of the Bible. We read about Moses. You know, Moses was a man who God said would lead his household according to his ways. We also read about, Mo, uh, uh, that was Abraham, Moses. About Moses we read a man who is the most humble person in the face of the earth. This is God's testimony about man, about Moses. God also says this about Job. What did he say about Job? He said about Job, there is no man who is upright or who is not, who is blameless and upright. In the face of the earth. These are the testimonies that God has given about many people in history. And we know about this man, David. David says, God says about David, a man according to God's own heart. And while I was meditating on this psalm, I asked the question to myself, why did God call David a man according to his own heart? You know, David has a man, a fallen creature like all of us, has committed grievous sin, correct? David has some things that most of us has not done. He has done something very sinful while he was the king of Israel. But still God, who knows the end from the beginning, who knows every person's heart, who knows a thought before it comes into our mind, God knows it full well, full well. We may be able to fool each other by being very nice people among each other. I, one person may say good things about another person, but it's a different thing God telling about us, who knows us full well. The Bible says before even we were born, he knew us. Before a thought comes into our mind, he knows it all. So David is a man according to God's own heart. And why did God give that testimony? And what would God think about us? And what would God be God's testimony about us if God gives us, an, us, us his opinion? So when I was examining the scripture, you know, the first verse itself it says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill? This is David asking this question. And throughout the Psalms, when you look at the theme of David's Psalms, Psalms written by David, you will always hear this theme that he is longing to see his father. He is longing to see his God. 
And I, I guess, maybe probably that is the reason why God called him a man according to his own heart. There could be other reasons. You are smart people. You may examine Bible and you may find other reasons. But when I go throughout the Bible, it says in Psalms 27, again a Psalm of David, it says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is David looking for? To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 23 verse 6 says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? Psalm 61 again. These are a few verses that I picked up very quickly, but that is the overarching theme of David's psalm. He says over here, I long to dwell in your tent forever. I take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You know, David in Psalms 122 says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, what? Let us go into the house of the Lord. How do we do when we compare ourselves to David? You know, God gave us Jesus Christ who's supposed to be the model. But that's a very high standard. Let us not go to that high standard. Let's go a little lower in standard and see whether we can reach the standard of David so that God can also say about us, this person, that person is a man according to our God's own heart. Do we long to be in the house of the Lord? How joyful are we when people say, come let us go for a prayer meeting. How joyful we are in saying, let us have fasting and prayer for three days. Let us all come together and fast. Forget food, forget work, forget everything. Let us sit in the presence of the Lord and fast. How joyful are you when you hear such words from the pulpit when God or pastor, pastor calls out saying that we are going to have three day fasting. I will not ask this question, how many of you took three days fasting? You know who it is. But when a three day fasting is declared, how many people are very joyful in saying, you know what, I'm going to forsake everything of this world. I'm going to sit in the presence of God and that will be the most joyous occasion in my life. Probably that is the reason. Why God called David a man according to his own heart. So now he's asking this question. Psalms 15 verse 1. Lord who may dwell in your sanctuary. David is a man who God raised up from the ashes. He was nothing. Even his father forgot him. While the prophet Samuel came. And God was going to anoint a man from the house of Jesse. To be the next king of Israel. Even his father forgot David. Because he was a younger son. And not even counted to be qualified. To be a man to stand in the row. Of people who are going to be anointed. You see. God has a plan for every person. It was not the ability of the other brothers. But God chose a man. And that man was David. Where was he? He was not there when Samuel came, but he was attending to the sheep of his father. That's where David was. But while he was a shepherd, he wrote many psalms. He, he sang God's praises. And I'm saying this, it says a psalm of David in Psalms 50. Now, but let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if Psalm of David, if Psalm wrote this, David, this psalm, if David wrote this psalm, we would not be reading about it today. But let me tell you, this psalm is a psalm of God. And Dave was given the words and he wrote it down. He wrote it down so it becomes scripture. But it is inspired word of God. And that's why it is included in the Bible today. And that's why we are reading it. David might have written this while he was shepherding the sheep. He might have written while he was running away from Saul, hiding in the caves. We do not know. Probably he was sitting in a, a very good place in his palace when he wrote this psalm. We do not know. But why did God give him that utterance? God wanted us to see a man like David. And God gave him this word. So today, it is in the Holy Scriptures. It is God's word. And what does the Bible say about God's the entire Bible? Every scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. Every scripture, including the book of Psalms, or the psalm that we just read, Psalms 15, it is God's word and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Dear brothers and sisters, we have God's word. Even though it is spent by different people, it is an inspired word of God. And so it is living and active, sharper than the double-edged sword. 
and it can be useful for your life. So when you read this and an exhortation comes out from the pulpit, do not receive it and throw it away so it makes no difference. But if you receive it and have a change in your heart, renewal of the mind brings about transformation of the heart. And with the transformation of the heart, you change your lifestyle and you draw closer to God. And those are the questions that's asked over here. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy? An important question asked over here. A similar question was asked by the jailer. What must I do to be saved? It is a similar question. What must I do to be saved? He is saying, who may dwell? Pl plainly put it in English terms. Lord, who will be in heaven with you? Who will enter heaven? And the answer to that question is right below it. Now you may ask, hey, if you know the answer, why are you asking the question? Right? We may have very intelligent people who may say, if you know the answer to the question, why are you just asking? Because David asks the question and immediately answers the question. Why? It is not for David. God has put it in his heart so that today I and you can meditate on God's word. It says over here, he who walks blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on, on his, okay, and so on. So that's the second verse, he who walks blameless and who does what is righteous and who speaks the truth from his heart. Everything else is a list of other sins that people commit. But here it is asked question, he whose walk is blameless. Now let me ask you, blameless in whose eyes? My brothers and sisters, they all love me. They will all think that I am blameless. But does it matter? The question is asked with the word Lord. So who is the question asked? God. The question is asked to God Almighty. The all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God. This question is asked to Him. And it doesn't matter what my wife tells me, tells about me, my children tell, think about me. It doesn't matter what my brothers and sisters in the Lord think about me. It doesn't matter. What really matters is what does God think about you. And it says, the Lord looks, look, sorry. It says, he who walk is blameless. He whose walk is blameless. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every one of us. We were born in sin. Ephesians chapter 2 says, You were born in trespasses and in sin. Can anybody say that they are blameless? According to the Bible, all have sinned. And everybody is guilty. Everybody, everyone who is breathing and living is guilty. But how can he enter into the kingdom of God? One of the qualities is you have to be blameless by God. God should testify that you must be blameless. But we are born in sin. Born in trespasses and sin. Psalms 14 says, The Lord looks down from heaven and all mankind to see if there's anyone who understands, anyone who seeks God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. God's testimony about man. Psalms, again David says in Psalms 51, Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Think about it, brothers. If God examines our life, will any one of us make it to heaven? Will anyone be blameless? We are all guilty before God. Because of Adamic sin, we inherit sin. And also we commit a lot of sin during, the, during our life. So according to this psalm, according to this qualification that David is putting over here, everybody is guilty. Nobody is blameless. So, whether we have hope to go into heaven. So it says over here, he whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart. You know the human heart condition. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, every thought and inclination of the human heart is wickedness continually. Who's saying this? It is God's diagnosis of the human heart. And David says, he who speaks the truth from his heart. If the heart is so corrupt, Whatever comes out from the heart is also corrupted. There is no truth coming out from the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If the heart is corrupt and heart is wicked, how can we be righteous? How can we be truthful? So we have a major problem. The heart itself is very hard. 
Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. No man can cure a human heart. It is wicked. It is completely wicked. And it says, who can understand it so that they can fix it? Nobody can fix a human heart. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the heart. And when God weighs our heart, we will always be found guilty. Because out of the abundance of the heart, everything that we do happens. And if the heart is wicked, we will be wicked and we will not be able to enter God's kingdom. It says over here, who is righteous, who does what is righteous. The Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. All have turned away and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Who's saying this? God of the Bible says that no one is good. So when you're saying, how are you doing brother? I am good. Really? Really? <laughs> But that's our colloquial language, right? When people ask, how are you doing? I'm very good. Yes. For my brothers and sisters, I'm very good. But if God examines our hearts and life, are we found good? So in this, according to this qualities of this standard, according to the Bible, according to these two verses, no one can enter into the kingdom of God. But let me, do one, let me tell you one thing, brothers. There is a good news, the true good news, that Jesus Christ came into this world because God loved us fallen people and we are unable to reach heaven. Nobody in their own self-righteousness can enter into the kingdom of God. We are all guilty before God. But let me read you one verse, brother. It is by the Lord Jesus Christ that we are made eligible to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, I have only 15 minutes. I would like to dwell and jump into the gospel message, but we do not have time for that. But you know, Christ died for us so that he, we don't have to take the punishment. He opened the way for us. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not come under the judgment of God, but must have eternal life. The Bible says all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the answer of all our solution problems is that Jesus Christ, he became the eternal sacrifice for us. And through him, we have access to heaven. Verse Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, he, For he chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We cannot be blameless. We are blameless because of the work and person of Jesus Christ. That was done on the cross. Dear brothers and sisters, time is up. I do not know. I, I'm not even looking at my watch, but you know, there's so much coming up. But I know I have only 15 minutes. But let me tell you, because of one man's trespass, that was Adam, all men became sinners. But Jesus Christ came to nullify what happened with Adam. He became the sinless person who came into this world and he lived a sinless life and he became the sacrifice for us. You know, Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our iniquities and crushed for our transgression. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. By His wounds, we are healed. We all had gone astray. We all like sheep had gone astray. But the Lord chose to put upon Him the iniquities of us all. It was God who crushed Him on the cross so that you and I could be saved. By our own strength, we are guilty of going. But we can always trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the work and person of Jesus Christ, we have access to heaven. Yes, according to these two verses, no man can enter into the kingdom of God. But there is a, there is a propitiatory sacrifice, the Lord and, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and who paid the price for our sins. Brothers and sisters, even during the time of Paul, let me tell you this, it's a very important thing. There is a lot, this, the devil is real, the devil is real, and the devil is always out to get God's people. He doesn't want to attack people who are already under his, his shackles, who are already bound to sin. He doesn't attack, he attacks the church. And the way he nowadays attacks the church is by bringing the false gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, there's only one true gospel. The message of the cross is 
the message of the cross is perishing is, is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god unto salvation so there is one gospel but the way the devil is diluting this gospel the way the, the devil is attacking the church is by diluting the gospel even in the book of galatians we read paul saying if anyone comes and speaks to you a different gospel than the one that i have already spoken let him be a curse let him be an anathema it says that means be curse why because during paul's time also there were people who are floating a different gospel a diluted gospel and i'll tell you brothers and sisters the devil is real and churches are filled with people who have followed the go- false gospel and i'll tell you the true gospel starts with repentance jesus christ when he started his message his ministry in this world he started by saying the word repent for the kingdom of god is near even john the baptist when he started his ministry he said repent for the kingdom of god is near repentance means turn away from your sinfulness so repent means consider understand that we are sinful in nature repentance means asking god for forgiveness now repentance cannot come without conviction conviction has to happen without conviction there is no repentance repentance for conviction must have so conversion by conviction you must be convicted of your sin and those who are convicted of their sin will have godly sorrow and out of the godly sorrow they will call upon god in repentance and god will forgive them their sins those are the people who will enter into the kingdom of god and they will not be they will be found blameless in god's eyes because somebody else paid the price dear brothers and sisters we are very happy we are very very blessed people blessed people psalm 32 starts by saying what blessed is a man psalm 32 starts with the word blessed and it says blessed is the blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered blessed is the man whose sins the lord does not count against him and in whose spirit there is not deceit brothers and sisters we have entrance into heaven not because of our righteous deed we are blame we are we we are always guilty before god but it is not my righteousness it is the righteousness of jesus christ that makes me eligible to go to heaven colossians chapter 1 talks about our oh, being thankful for god who qualified us to be in, to come into his kingdom colossians chapter 1 i'm paraphrasing it but but let me tell you god qualifies us to come into his kingdom but for some but but the lord's the lord jesus christ himself was disqualified and that he, because of his disqualification we are qualified to enter into his kingdom dear brothers and sisters it's a blessed thing to come to the church hear the word of god but help may god give us grace to live a true christian life may we shine as a light not just come on sunday and sit and go but throughout the week may god give us grace that we may live holy and righteous life because as we re- learned in the book of revelation one day the trumpet will sound one day the lord jesus christ will come down from heaven uh, with the sound of archangels and one day all those who are longing to wait longing for his appearing those people will be caught up in heaven it doesn't matter whether we come to church if you are not preparing for meeting with the lord you know we'll find out one day where we stand and you know there's going to be a day of separation a separation between the sheep and the goat there's going to be a separation between the chaff and the wheat and may god give us grace that we may live holy lives so that one day we shall be in heaven who shall enter god's your temple who shall enter your sanctuary who shall enter your heaven it is those who are blameless blameless according to god's eyes may god give us grace to live holy and righteous life may god bless us with this words